The following podcast is a next level production. This is someone's idea of heaven. <laughs> What the? Hey, buddy. You. No. Get back ah. here. Get back ah. here. That tickles. Uh, let me go. Oh. You. You may not be able to feel pain, but I could throw you through walls for all eternity, Klaus. You will never get a moment of peace and quiet. I will never stop. No, 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 no. The void is my house. It might be a bouncy house, but it's mine. You don't want to help the family. Fine. But the love of my life is walking into hell. I don't even know if I can. Hey, panelists, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Robert. And this is going to be a spoiler full podcast about the Umbrella Academy season three, episodes nine and ten. Now, sorry, panelists, that we haven't had, you know, it's been inconsistent with like certain episodes coming out, but we're getting there. We're actually getting there. And then uh, the next episode coming up shortly will be Peacemaker season one review. But in this case, we're uh, we're covering Umbrella Academy. But the next episode, you will have Steve Brown as well as uh, Rob and myself. And we're going to be covering season one of Peacemaker. So keep that in mind. So if you have any feedback for that, we'll let you know about the feedback at the end of the episode. Or if you're a listener consistently, you know how to send feedback. So with that, we're going to move right into Umbrella Academy season three, episode nine, Seven Bells. And the synopsis for this particular episode is one last plea and vote at the meeting. Reginald tells tales of the same myth where the world is ending. But if seven bells are rung, then it will be saved. This was installed by whoever or whatever built time and space. So there could be a backdoor to fix this all. So uh, that's literally the plot <laughs> if you think <laughs> about it but right. doesn't really talk about what happens in between or uh memories or flashbacks uh or just feelings in general too because a lot of this particular episode it, i'm really moving right along into my initial thoughts but my initial thoughts are literally just it's moving into that aspect of uh, historical feelings within the characters, uh, Luther, I think, honestly, each of the Umbrella Academy students that were there and how, you know, this certain situation that Reginald kind of throws at them and they're, right. you know, they're skeptical, they still band together to figure out what they want to do in the end. They, they stick to their, uh, their their thoughts and their well being, and that that shows something a little bit that's pretty cool within each character. I think it's sort of like a human response to something. But since Reginald's right. not human, <laughs> as we know, exactly he, he won't <laughs> accept that. So it's one of those challenges that it was that it was because you get to see how each at the very end when they vote identify with their own humanity and uh the world itself and how they feel about their quote unquote adoptive father. Yeah. Which leads into so much too because this guy's been, you know, he's an alien. He took these kids in, trained them on various multiverse points, if you think about it. And it's always some sort of the same kind of concoction because you get the sparrows, you get the umbrellas who knows whatever multiverse versions of them are there. But I think at the very end of the season, I think we do see another version, but we'll get into that when we get into uh, episode 10. Right. But, but the, uh, you know, as I said before, everybody spoilers. So obviously you had long time to watch this show or this season. So if you're, you're following through as you're, you're watching for the first time, that's great. If not, Sorry. And then for those who've already watched it and are just listening to this because, hey, I want to hear a different perspective. It's fine. <laughs> it might be different, 
might be the same for many other podcasters, but we're going to try to do our best and uh, go into what we thought within the epi- episode itself. And you could probably contrast and compare it. But nonetheless, we'll move right into it. So, Rob, what were your thoughts about this particular episode? I, I said it was very much uh, foreshadowing, more in depth all that good stuff about these particular characters. I mean, yeah, that's, there's a lot of, um, I mean, of course there's a lot of revelations on, you know, where this whole, uh, this whole season is going. Mm -hmm. Um, some of these characters on how they've changed, especially Allison, how, you know, Allison has been kind of portrayed almost in the, like the evil, uh, as she was evil. more meek in the very beginning of the series. Right. But because of everything that she, right, but because of everything that she's been going through, I mean, she's become basically the like the bad guy of the almost the bad guy of um of this season. Yes. And so, you know, so kind of very interesting how they took that character in that direction. And you kind of see these revelations when it comes to her on why she does what she does. And you kind of understand why she does it, but it's just the way she goes about it. And throughout this entire season um, has been kind of like, wow, you know, they, they really took this character in, in a different direction. Yeah. I like the I like the fact that it showed also um, in the beginning, it showed Luther in the, uh, you know, on the moon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Luther being the happy-go-lucky guy that he is, um, but showing him how he was, you know, very energetic, I guess, <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> and by day 972 or something like that, he was uh, just a mess. Almost uh, three com- years later. <laughs> yeah, just a complete mess. But we get that revelation of, you know, why is why it he that was he, there? Why yeah. he was there, which yeah. is, you know, and then in the beginning, you're like, who the hell is that person? And then you, you realize know? that. Somewhat throughout, you, you get piece, you get pieces of there. Correct. So, so just, right, thoughts, like so. In, I know, like on episode ten, they re- reveal more, but, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, no, it's uh, that was actually very interesting. Um, it just again, he was very happy on in that sense, and then, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but when he first started in the moon, he wasn't as big and bulky, right? Is I that didn't like, think so either. I I, I thought I he saw still him had like the gorilla parts to him, right? But they weren't as bulky. It, I think it had to do with his regiment of working out, right? And the amount of protein that he had on the space he, station. He had a lot of soy, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of soy, but yeah, no, it's just that part. I. Uh, I found that interesting, you know, on, you know, those, those moments there. So, but yeah, no, it was, uh, again, this episode and, and of course, you know, and we'll get into some of those details, but like also towards the end on how bad Reginald, uh, what, how bad of a character, not the character itself, but (laughs) how evil, how evil this, right. This character is. And it was all because of what, you know, gets revealed towards episode uh, 10. Yeah. But it's just it, it's amazing that, you know, and then you wonder why these poor kids are broken, <laughs> you know, and, and it doesn't matter which version of him. So there was a version of the um, the Umbrella Academy and then there's a version of the Sparrow, you know, Academy and stuff like that. Correct. So, but yeah. but there, it's still the same kind of like the same. As a matter of fact, he's probably even worse than the <laughs> the uh, umbrella guy. Yeah, he was very manipulative, more manipulative, I think. And, Correct. and also in the fact that you know, Klaus got him off the drugs that they were doping him with and that's literally what brought all this out because Correct. It, from for a long time he's been a prisoner of the kids and just being the spokes representation of of the sparrows and then once he comes out of that, he sees it as a way of like, all right, I'm going to use this to get what I need. Exactly. <laughs> and so, he does. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was, you know, that was my thought. My thought it was like, oh, okay. So it it, it, it let me see what, you know, how Allison, you know, mm-hmm. what how it all this has affected Allison, how, how it's affected everybody, actually everybody, Victor, um, Luther. Yeah. Uh, it's just everybody. And even Lila. Right. 
And Lila, yeah, you have some a uh, little bit, you know, uh, of a character development there uh, with her with more than you know what she had before. But yeah, no, yeah. it's just very interesting uh, this entire episode, which and it leaves you, you know, kind of like almost with that cliffhanger. It's like, holy <laughs> crap, what the hell's going on? But the ending of it, I thought was phenomenal too. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you talk about the ending of nine or ten? Nine. Okay, nine. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So, what is your thought? No, no, my initial thoughts were, were already covered. Uh, I I do agree with you. It's like a, a favorite moment of mine too would be Luther on the moon and his journey and see how how he felt pretty much abandoned, but he had hopeful dreams because hey, I'm doing this for Dad. I'm doing yes. a special mission for Dad and uh, exactly. on the moon. But he was still pining for Allison throughout that time. If you think about it, you can see him with the pictures and everything. Right. And then obviously, you know, that body being shown, how it was developing. I, I had that in my notes as well. I forgot. And he, uh, you know, and then the breakdown of him and it's just how he felt. And that's why he feels useless at times. I think this is where we get the whole he's doing everything for Reginald Hargreaves to love him more, like right. going to the moon. And we mm-hmm. see this at, in the later episode, in episode 10, and I definitely will reference it. But the uh, the fact also that he's missing out on everything that's going on with Allison and everything else, which causes his depression and even more of his infatuation with her, if you Correct. think about it. So I, I the a lot of people don't like this particular character within the show, and I know this. Who, but, Luther? Yeah, I know a lot of people who don't like him. They think of him as a buffoon, even sometimes and thinking of the actor itself. But uh, I've had conversations with women and guys. They're like, oh, what an idiot. That guy's terrible. He, he's supposed to be the captain. He sucks. And then uh, they'll get, oh, he's not as attractive as you think. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's a first. <laughs> I've heard okay. that. I yeah. actually like that character a lot because it just kind of shows, you know, it's just he's a... Uh, well, yeah, he might be the, uh, you know, the leader of the group or whatever it is, but he's still, you know, he's a character with a big heart. And at the he's same time, he's got a big heart, but not really much of a brain. He's yeah, not, it's just he he's let, not the Cyclops of the Umbrella Academy, like X no. X Men. You know, he's literally the guy who will hug you, help you out, and work together with you as a group, even though he is deemed as the captain. Right. But you have to also remember that uh, with a group like that, which they're so dysfunctional, having him be the basically the glue that keeps them almost together. Yeah. um, Is what actually helps them, I think, too, at the same time. He kind of I think he brings a way of uh, centering them. I think in a certain way. I I think it's more of like being the older brother representation, even though they technically are siblings, but are not really you know biological siblings no (laughs) exactly yeah so they 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 have a collectiveness they see him as uh, he could like we were stating he could be the heart of the group yeah because everybody you know it just seems like everybody does like him and of course he he has this you know or had this big crush you know with uh allison and stuff like that and Mm -hmm. And again, I'll go back to Allison on the stuff that she's done this season. I mean, everything from even trying to manipulate him, you know, Mm -hmm. in a sexual way, which honestly borders on the assault. Yeah, the rape and assault, you know, (laughs) which is which is really that's why it was very interesting to see her her character on, you know, which direction she went. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's just, uh, you know. I, I kind of like, you know, the fact that they revealed that part in the beginning and you're like, oh, and then they reveal why he's there. And you're like, what the hell is that? You know, <laughs> so what what is this going to what's going to happen there? So mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Uh, so, yeah, no, it was, uh, again, great episode. Uh, mm-hmm. I like the fact that it left me. Wanting, wanting more, more. Yeah, yeah yeah wanting more i was like oh shit what's happening i gotta see the end next set. that's the great thing about netflix is the fact that you know you, you have go that right binge model it. that you go right into it <laughs> um if this was more of a weekly thing holy mm. crap it would have left you for a whole week you would have been like i'm gonna pull my hair you know, <laughs> well, I-, <laughs> I i know people that have done this episode weekly oh really and, yeah and 
I, I give them a lot of credit too, because it's a lot of staying off the internet. Yeah. Anything that dumps on Netflix. And as you and I both know, we're just going to watch it all at once. Or the only thing that really, uh, shows that didn't really do that too much would be like on HBO Max. Like with, uh, Watchmen, they dropped like the first two episodes in a row. And then afterwards it was episodically. Same right. thing with Peacemaker, I think. And <clears throat> there's like a whole bunch of them. And it makes you wanting more. I guess as soon as you get a little bit more than what you would get out of one particular episode, you would get, want it to see it weekly. But there are those people that are out there that are devoted, not just podcasting. I'm not just talking about podcast friends that are out there right. that do Netflix shows just like we do. But they would do it episodically. But there are those people who I know personally who are friends that, ooh, don't even listen to my podcast, which is fine. <laughs> but they would tell me like, yeah, I just, I watch it weekly. We, it, it's something, it's our thing to do that one thing to do together that time of the week. And it was something that we stumbled upon. Maybe we binge watched it the first season completely through and realized, right. well, let's spread this out. That had that's a lot of fortitude in my opinion when you get something that's like it's right there everything the whole beans yeah uh, yeah uh, now with uh shows like the last of us coming out on hbo max they're only doing it episodically correct Bang. i mean and there and there's an argument to be uh to be said about you know whether whether binging or or doing it weekly is a good thing i think you know again i think netflix being netflix and being the one that came out with that binge model first yeah uh, that was fun because it was like oh crap i get a whole season i could just binge watch it and i'm done i don't have to wait every week but when disney came out with uh the mandalorian mm -hmm. uh and they started doing it every week yeah it made it made people you know just talk about each episode and then get them excited for the next so there is a there is a you know there's a good reason for going uh, weekly or and there's sometimes a good reason for doing you know the binging model because there are times that you just want to sit there and you're like screw it i just want to see the whole thing <laughs> there, there should be that's something that netflix should really pay into with their their software through their app listen don't give them any ideas because <laughs> right right now what they right now what they're trying to do is the ad model for all we know <laughs> they'll listen to something like this and say so let me get this straight we could have them at a pay at a at a certain tier. They get it weekly, but if they pay more, they could get the whole thing. <laughs> Copyright panels to pixels and Rob Moda. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that that would be crazy. It's like oh, you know, like some people would be watching it weekly, and we're like, ah, I already saw the whole thing. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but the, it, it's I, I give them credit, and that's pretty cool, and and it's yeah. great to do that episodically. But unfortunately, us as we watch the show and we podcast about it. We have to watch it and binge it and watch it a few times. So right. that's the benefit behind it. You could also do that even if it was episodically, if we did it weekly as it was coming out, because usually on stream platforms, you could watch it over and over again, just like on AMC plus. Correct. Uh, yeah. Well, I've been doing that with interview with a vampire that my friend Danny and I are going to be covering on adrenaline cinema podcast. I so still haven't watched that. Um, honestly, yeah, I thought it was done very well, completely different from the book. So ladies right. and gentlemen, if you're purists out there and love Anne Rice's work as it's written in the text, stick to that and leave it to your own imagination. If you're somebody who's open minded and a different idea of writing or how it's being presented from the book form and modernized in some ways. I think it was done very, very well. And the actors that were picked, I think, were perfect for it. It just gave me the same vibes as I did when I watched uh, True Blood. You know, when True Blood okay. came out, that to me was very original. But that was also based on a book. And then some of the Sookie Stackhouse diary books were different. Right. But, you know, honestly, uh, I, I just love the fact that you can do that. But uh, like I does said, it, does it does it have at least uh, the same vibe as the movie or it does? It, it does, does have okay. the same vibe of the movie. Uh, you do have the 
how Louis and uh oh I'm forgetting Lestat right. come together. Uh, the girl that's involved, especially within a movie that everybody loves because it was uh, Kirsten Dunst. Right. And it was a white girl. In this case, it's a black girl. And Louis is black. Uh, and, oh, okay. That's a good Yeah, take. so Lestat. And it, and it deals within New Orleans because it was right. mixed. And so it's a different take. I, I, I do enjoy it when Danny comes on and when we talk about it on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. But Lara as well. Uh, it's going to be interesting for the fact because it, it's a completely different. And Lara, who'd read the book, is going to give her ideas and thoughts. And, right. You know, to me, you know, that's just like even with the comic realms or even with even with this particular show that we're covering, it's a little bit different in comparison to the comic. It's not verbatim. Right. Just like with the boys when we covered the boys. You know, Hero Gasm didn't really play out as what we saw in the the show. If you go back to uh, the boys, the last season of the boys, and you know that weird, right. oddly episode that we covered, you, Steve, and I. And the thing is, is that these are adaptations, so some people would have a lot of problems with them. Okay. I don't really reference the comic for this particular one because I didn't really read it. I right. I only briefed over it, but. Honestly, uh, I the way Steve and I and with Rob, we just watch it as is, and I I accept it as the story as it's coming, which is pretty right. cool. But if somebody else came in and sent in feedback and said, "Hey, this was different," I would research that. So keep that in mind, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but uh, well, to get back into the episode, uh, correct. Uh, the one particular moment that I really did enjoy was Klaus and Ben coming together at one point, and this was the aftermath of the wedding. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they were just starting to click a little bit, and then as soon as Ben was like, you're referencing me. Oh, you're trying to change me into this guy. I'm right. not this guy. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I don't care how great he was. <laughs> yeah. No, I, uh, my, my, um, well, I, I enjoy that because, I mean, look, one of, my favorite characters on this show are Klaus and number <laughs> five. And I think that's, that's everybody's. I think Klaus is the one that a lot of people really like. A lot of the uh, ladies drift towards him because he's got that cute little innocent kind of attitude. And oh, right. I'm so happy. And then he's a character, man. It's just such a great character. <laughs> such a, like there's, there's that Part of him that, you know, is and you've seen like the development of his character throughout all three seasons, which has been <laughs> really cool. But it's it just is. really it's just really funny the way they have done that character. Um and I'm then just of more of like the bad boy. Uh, the what? The bad boy. He's like the bad boy. You don't get involved with the bad boy. Oh. <laughs> he gets himself into a lot of trouble and stuff, you know, even though he's like a little kid now <laughs> in a little kid form. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed that a lot of women were saying goes, but he's cute. In real life, he's really only 24 or 25. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Keep telling yourself that. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but the, you know, but uh, also people love Fives. Uh, his gumption, his, one, his, his attitude. Yes. I mean, his one-liners are just fucking epic, man. I mean, they just, they're the so writers great. writers got that down perfect it was so great and the actor I, I forgot the name of the actor but let me tell you i think i think he's like 20 years old now but in the you know he 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 really has the spirit of an old man in him oh yeah yeah so i mean he's phenomenal at, the, at that you know with that uh with that role but his I delivery love, is always perfect too with perfect. this line it's just he he just has a way to deliver these great lines and and I mean, as a matter of fact, I was looking on YouTube uh, the other day and there's like a big YouTube video with all his one liners. <laughs> and it's just great. It's like, I think, like 20 minutes of that. And I was like, that's amazing that they can actually do that. But it, when you watch <laughs> it, you just kind of see and he and and you could really, really see how he has grown in the uh, in the show, because when in the first season, he looks so much younger than in the third season. Um. But it's just his delivery is just phenomenal. Awesome. 
Yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm looking more to see him in other films. You know, yeah. I, yeah. As you look forward, because obviously we know Elliot Page been around forever, right? Uh, you know, Juno. Uh, geez, uh, what was that oh. Leonardo DiCaprio movie everybody loves and I love, but I forget the name. Uh not sure what you're talking about <laughs> oh it's all the everybody going into each other's minds and it looks oh, like dr strange uh, and the multiverse of madness oh no not flatliners deception um, inception inception oh inception inception yeah no phenomenal <laughs> yeah so they I were mean, in that i have that movie it's just incredible i always forget the name it's so funny it's like i can yeah. remember and i could see certain scenes but one scene really tricked me on trivia because it was yeah. a lego person and she was and she was Kitty Pride, uh, or he was Kitty Pride when. Um, yeah, they they played Kitty Pride in the X Men, the Fox right. X Men series, right? And uh, they made a name for themselves with the Umbrella Academy as well. Obviously, Juno was a big movie hit that they had done, right? And you know, and also with the the public uh, publicizing of their gender change and how they identified themselves. So I thought that was, you know, we all know Elliot Page over the right. years, whether right. or whatever it may be. But uh, the one who plays Luther, uh, that particular actor, I had mentioned to when when Steve and I were covering it, he was in a Netflix movie not too long ago in between. So it was more of a rom-com. You get to hear his British accent. He's doing a little bit more. I would love to see the the actress who plays Allison in more. I think she's very talented, and I'm pretty yeah. sure I have seen her in it, but I in another film, but I just don't recognize her. It's like it's one of those things. Yeah, uh, a- Emmy Raver uh, Lampman is her name, and uh, yeah, she's she's really good. Uh, like I said, I liked her character this. Uh, yeah, this season, uh, it was pretty good. All right. Well, did you have anything like uh, that you would want to top on that you would that you liked? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, as I covered before, you know, I think Allison's uh, the the one other t- thing, like Allison being who she is, like the BS apology that she was just giving everybody because she was just trying to manipulate everybody, and you could see when she hugged um, Victor, it was just like the look, that evil look on her face. Just you could tell that I was like, okay, this you could tell that was BS. Luther, actually, when she tried to apologize to Luther, he caught on very quickly. Yes, he did. On, you know, uh, <laughs> on, on that. So I thought that was actually uh, very cool. And like we were saying, you know, um, Reginald uh, being who he is, the way he, I mean, he kills Luther. Which actually, that I was so surprised when I saw that. I was like, "Holy crap!" Well, that <laughs> that was a hard one to watch, uh, but it, it's that's what I'm I was referring to before because of Luther came to Hargreaves trying to like make his father happy, right? At that point, and at that point, you know, he as Hargreaves winds up stabbing him in the chest with. It looked like a tendril. I don't know if it was a tail or a tendril. It was some kind of alien thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, then taking something a tendril out of his hand, like his arm or something, and it looking right. like a sword and cutting across his uh, chest as well. I don't know if his throat, but thus killing it was, him. It was across. It was uh, he stabbed him in the heart, and then he just cut him across the chest. I thought so. so okay. Right. So it could seem like it was the guardians who came in and actually killed them. So, and then the really cool thing is like, well, cause when everybody was in the room, mm-hmm. you could see where Allison looks at Reginald with suspicion because she's, uh, you know, as, as we all know, you know, the Reginald and, and, um, and Allison actually, um, somehow you know did some kind of deal but you could see that she was looking at him with suspicion because she's like ah this is not what i signed up for so yeah so yeah so that was one of them um and then the other one uh reginald leaves klaus behind (laughs) you know that remember he leaves them like when they're all going through the uh through the portal Mm -hmm. uh he leaves klaus behind and you know because he did not want klaus to tell the others 
Yes. He basically he... kills Klaus, but he forgets how Klaus can adapt with his powers. Right. And honestly, that... well, he doesn't even kill him. I love the way Klaus actually figured out and said uh, that he was, you know, he's going to kill himself, but it was an epic way for him that he killed himself. So yeah. I just love the way he just kind of jumps, turns around, and in slow motion he uh, he gets stabbed by the white, you know, the horn from the white rhino or the white buffalo that's in the yes, uh, which was always been foreshadowing for the whole season because you knew that was going to be somebody's death, right? So, and, but it was actually really cool, and then it ends there, and I thought that was actually a cool way the way it ended as he's looking at the entire world, you know, just kind of disintegrate you know yeah. But yeah so it was those were two kind of like the end that's what that's what made this episode so great towards the end was one you're like holy crap they kill luther and then two klaus kills himself and he was smart enough to kill himself knowing that he could then come back yeah but it's the fact that is the fact that reginald left them behind because he knew since klaus can talk to the dead he just didn't want klaus telling um the uh the group that you know reginald killed luther so but yeah no it's a great episode man i i liked it i mean uh, as a i think last episode this episode and then the uh the uh number 10 were just the, all three of them i would say is a, it's a good group for the ending of this yeah i i would say too the one thing that i liked about the uh you know of all things the death scene of luther but the what what Reginald actually says to him at, before he makes his strikes, he goes, "You know what they say about uh, an ev- uh, what a event brings people together or their families together than uh, than a wedding." He goes, "A funeral," and then right. that's when he does. And then his- he kills him, right? Yeah, I-, I thought that was actually yeah, I thought that was really good, and then. Uh- I, you know, also when, you know, when he left Klaus behind, it's like, you're just too much trouble. Yeah, you know? well, it, it's, <laughs> well, the thing is, is it's Klaus. <laughs> and he yeah. is very much very troubled. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so there, there was another cute quote that I have to before we get into the next episode, but I thought it was pretty funny. It was Diego. And he says this to Lila. It's the one thing that every guy usually says. If they're ever in a relationship, if they're married, he goes, why can't I be right just once? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, if you've ever been in a relationship, that is true. One of the <laughs> one of the quotes I liked, yeah, was Klaus in the beginning when telling Ben, "It's like last night you opened your kimono to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was drinking something and I spilled almost my drink. That was just like." <laughs> Fuck, man, it's just his delivery is so great when it comes to that kind of stuff, man. It's it was perfect. Real... Uh, he needs yeah. he needs to do more comedies, if anything. <laughs> yeah, that would no, be perfect. It, it was great. It was <laughs> absolutely. But before we go into like the next episode, I mean, I, sure. I, I will say this. Um, there was one little thing. How number five? When uh, he says, "Well, you know," because uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Luther was saying, "Well, you know," he was always so harsh when he was a. Uh, evaluating us and number five goes really i always got a five (laughs) (laughs) that was kind of cute and then um and i'll be honest with you you know like the the effects on this show were pretty great i mean just the cougar blitz eating the world i mean i thought that was a great effect yeah But, but i would say this man the music i mean even though they only had two music they had one by the cure and the other one by billy idol i mean just the needle drop on this episode was uh great well, that's the coolest thing about this particular show. Um, I still go back, and my favorite memory of the show would be, oh, uh, I was it a Joy Division song? It's about going into space, and you see the uh, chimpanzee going in, into space when Hargreaves starts to train him to be an astronaut and everything, and before he comes down and starts speaking. Right. Yeah, I, I was like, to me, that was like the perfect. It was like, like a music video and i still love it (laughs) yeah so no great episode i i enjoyed it and uh i can't you know can't wait to talk about the uh number 10 all right well with that we'll move right along right into the umbrella academy season three episode 10 entitled oblivion (laughs) (laughs) 
So the synopsis of this particular uh, episode is Luther learns about the afterlife. Over the Hotel Obsidian, Diego warns everyone against ringing the front desk bell unless they want to lose some appendages. <laughs> <laughs> the knife-loving Hargreaves also informs them they are unable to leave through the front door. Which is true. Thank yeah. you. And it's revealed why after that, you know, of yeah. course. So, But, uh, yeah, th- it's kind of vague in some aspects. We don't get the final delivery of everything as of as to what happens, why the family is the way they are right now at this point, which is good. So if somebody hadn't watched like the last four or five episodes, they jump into this. They're like, well, this is new. Right. <laughs> and then they just like, OK, uh, because the synopsis won't really tell them much. Right. Except for, you know. You know, Diego's gone crazy and Luther learned something crazy in the afterlife. It, it, you know, he could have been sleeping for all we know. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but with, with that uh, initial thoughts on this particular episode, it's being the final episode of the season. What were your overall thoughts? My thoughts on, yeah, my thoughts on this, um, especially after they uh, got back, um, some of the, again, some of the revelations. So, and, you know, we already said a spoiler alert, but, you know, the fact that the hotel they went into is not really a hotel. It's just a construct for a machine that they're in. It, it's limbo in the universe. I always right. think of it as that and built in with. Uh, uh, it's like I, I think of it more of the Catholic religion. You got your heaven. You got your in between. Right. And you got your hell. So yeah. I think they're at that in between because they could float up here or there and they're floating more down. <laughs> to well, <hell. laughs> well, I mean, you could see. Well, so the way it begins, I mean, of course, is by seeing Klaus and Luther mm-hmm. in, in like purgatory kind of exactly, thing, you know, so and then how I, I like the fact that, you know, Klaus is just kind of enjoying it while Luther is not even knowing what's going on and then kind of figures it out. Mm-hmm. Um but no, the uh, the the fact that I mean, even Reginald says like you know this is this is a different dimension, and the this is a machine, but the construct looks like the hotel because it was just made that way, and so I thought yeah. that was really cool. I was like, oh, that's really cool. The fact that hmm. it's they somehow went through a portal to a different dimension in order to try to restart the universe, and it's in a machine that they actually did it. So I thought that was really cool. You get again, you know, you get some, um, <laughs> you get some again, some dialogue back. You get some characters that you know try to make up for you know what they did wrong or something like that. Yeah. Uh, very well ended, and of course the revelation of uh, you know, uh, Reginald. Um, it, it, while we knew that he was an alien, I think it was just how shocked Allison looked when she killed. Reginald, yeah, in and this sl- particular, and, yeah, right, and slid like half his head off, and, and it's like, all green mush. It's all green mush coming out of it, and it was like, like I was like, oh, okay, that <laughs> she seemed pretty shocked on that. I also like the fact that the guardians somehow were made up by cockroaches. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I was trying to dig in the depths of my brain from yeah the last two seasons. To think of was there cockroaches involved or insects, but also in, in my thoughts, I, I think of movies in a sense where certain aliens are insects. Right. So it could be another alien race that was created to be the guardian that fills up a whole thing to be that character. Uh, not not to uh, point a, a joke at Kevin Smith's yoga hosers when. You have the Bratsies, and they all come together into this one big full right, right. Bratsy soldier. You know, for you, Kevin Smith I mean, fans, it, right? But... <laughs> they could they could have all been made out of cockroaches, but the the fight sequences were actually pretty good. I yeah, actually they were intense. Yeah, so I like the uh, the fight. You know how they fought the uh, the guardians and how the, the result another... of it too. Yeah, exactly. So. And then how the so this is how you kind of also suspected that okay this hotel is actually very different from the other one was mm-hmm. that 
every time some of these characters will walk in through a door, all of a sudden they kind of walked in through a portal. Correct. And it, they were end up in another floor. So when you see number five, well, you see, what is it? You see v- Victor, Allison, and number five are all arguing. And then mm-hmm. Allison uh, leaves the, uh, the room. Victor follows. And as number five tries to follow, all of a sudden you see that he goes into a different floor. And you can t- actually tell if you're, if, because they show at a later time, they do a close up of the number on the, on the wall to show that it went from three to five. But when, if you look very carefully, when Klaus comes out of the room on the wall, it says number three. But as soon as he comes out, it turns into a five. Uh, and it's a very subtle little thing that you just have to look for it. Um, but it was just really cool, uh, the fact that, and then of course, you know, he's running into areas where, you know, there was supposed to be a hallway. Now there's a door. So that's how kind of, that's how you kind of suspect that, okay, this hotel is very different. Yes. So I yeah. thought those were really cool. How like the, it was trying to change. It didn't change much. Like I wish there was more of a crazier maze type of a <laughs> thing, but it, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Some other people thought it, it should have been more, and I was like, "Yeah, I thought it was fine." I mean, you got to remember that it, <laughs> they they were putting their money a lot in a lot of different kinds of, kind of effects. So it, it kind of gave me the vibes of Hellraiser and the different chambers of pleasure that they would have <laughs> at, <laughs> at certain points. It's like, okay, this is their own little multiversal hell. No, right. it's not the Event Horizon itself, but yeah, right, it is right. kind of hellish to them. <laughs> at certain points because it either could give you extreme pleasure or extreme pain. Right. And we see that within this. So if you like that kind of response, you know, that observation, please let me know. (laughs) So what did you think of the end? I mean, the ending was very, um, the ending, that whole battle scene with guardian. No, I'm talking about afterwards. So when, uh, well, that's their version of heaven, in my opinion. I I think about it. I I don't think so. You don't don't think so? You don't think so? No, because it's a new universe. Yes. I, you know, my thought is because think about it. So Luther dies. Basically, he comes back to help Sloan and goes for him via Klaus. Right. And and some and then Klaus loses control and can't get him back. Exactly. So, so another power that Hargreaves tapped you have into. Number five that all of a sudden has a severed arm. Yes, which uh, is foreshadowing because of the one that told him not to interfere, right? And don't go through with it because that was his future. So he basically got the future of the person that he spoke to. Correct. Same and- arm. Yeah, and then so when you see towards the end when like all of a sudden, you know, because they reveal, of course, that or at least it's revealed that the Umbrella Umbrella Academy and their powers are Mm -hmm. the ones that are feeding this machine. Yeah, because they got to look for the sigil and they need seven people in order to, you know, stand on each star. They find the stars and then create that sigil to get create that sigil. And then, of course, you could see like the particles or whatever it is from their powers. Mm -hmm feeding the machine allison you know then press after she kills a reginald then she presses the button and all of a sudden everything just kind of blanks out and goes away goes away and then next thing you know you see like an elevator open and you Mm -hmm. see them all coming out and so you see you see diego that he has his fingers back because his fingers were cut by uh one of the guardians in one of those episodes you see luther Luther goes back to normal. Like he looks like a normal person he now. He doesn't have the gorilla body parts on right. him. He's regular. Right. Uh, and oddly number, enough, we're a lanky looking Luther. Yeah. And then number five, of course, has his arm back. Mm-hmm. And they were all wondering what the hell's going on. Yes. Um, but Ben, we still have Ben. And that's the Ben from the Sparrows. That's not their Ben. Well, 
that's the whole thing. Ben is like in Korea and we don't know what, what Ben is this. And then of course, Sloan is uh, Sloan is nowhere to be seen. Correct. Allison is basically the only one that got what she wanted because yeah. she, right. She goes, you know, she now goes back to her daughter, you know, her family, which is what she's always, what that that's what she's wanted from the very beginning Correct. of this whole uh, season. No Sloan, no Sloan, which is what, you know, make, you know, that's why, uh, Luther was going a little crazy going, where are, you know, where are they? And they have no powers. Yep. And Lyle is there too, as well. They lost all their powers. And Mm -hmm. then you see all of a sudden the camera tracks up and you see that there is an entire city that's basically owned by, uh, yeah, Hargreaves, uh, Reginald. And then you see, um, his Who, lady next to him. Yeah, uh, what was her name? Um, I believe it's I didn't Abigail. Get the name. Abigail. Abigail. Okay. Abigail. So Abigail, he's you know, all, so he's done all of this for Abigail. Yes, it's basically what he did. So mm-hmm. he's been manipulating um, the the academy and making you know ha- putting all these kids through all these things just so he could bring her back. Yes. But now he owns like this entire city. Like he has like real estate and, you know, and business and everything. <laughs> so then it kind of leaves you with the question, you know, because so season f- season four, because they did get approved for season four. Mm-hmm. So season four really is going to be like, well, they have no powers. And now they're in a city that's actually owned by this alien. Mm-hmm. You know, so how, you know, that'd be, it's going to be very interesting to see what. How they season, wrap it up, yeah. too, because this will be the last season. This is, this will probably be the last season unless, you know, uh, Netflix actually uh, uh, definitely pays for a fifth. But it's going to be interesting to see that because there's a lot of things that came up and you're like, holy crap, <laughs> what's going to happen next? Yeah. But it was uh, it was good. I li- I like the fact that. They left it in such a weird way, and from the when you see from the camera uh, angle from the top, um, there are walkways. There are like six walkways, and all the characters just take a walkway, so you can see that they actually walked away from each other. Uh, very much symbolesque of the rug that we always said was the shining rug. Right. So it just. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you know how they're gonna go about this. Yeah, same here. Uh, especially when they stated that you know that season four will probably be its last season. They didn't. It, know, I don't know if they've confirmed it, but it, well, they it, did. Get, they did confirm a for a season four. Um, if they are gonna wrap it up on this season, hopefully they'll do. You know, they'll wrap it up really well. Well, they stated uh, for season two going into right. season three that they oh for the past like those first two seasons that the way that a lot of the cast played it off and played it out or even how they wrote it was as if it was going to be its last season because they didn't know if they would have another one right so each season is like kind of a standalone but also could add into something from the previous season itself right so i i think that's a very good way of writing in a sense, so you don't leave people on a cliffhanger that you don't know if, you know, it's like with this, with this ending, we could just imagine that they find their own world as being human. Right. And which, you know, it, if it ended that way, it kind of, it's still a cliffhanger because you're like, whoa, what the hell happened here? Um, but not as bad as, you know, listen, we've seen a lot of things happen in the industry, uh, lately yeah. where, uh, seasons have had cliffhangers where they you'd know that there was supposed to be another season, and next thing you know, the studio or the just streaming service just says, you it. know what? So even though it might be doing well, they're like, nope, we're we're just gonna cancel that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking, of, I'm I'm looking forward to it. There's a lot of shows out there though that did go on a high note, which right. I like. But the funny thing is, yeah, like you said, it, we've had those where it's like, wait. It ended. That was it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's a uh, there's a lot of shows out there. People are pissed because <laughs> like yeah, they, they they just got canceled and uh, HBO Max and and uh, Netflix and there's a few man. There's just quite a few that have been axing shows like crazy. 
Yeah. If you don't make the numbers, they're not going to keep you. <laughs> exactly. In or, some cases, in some cases, they do make the numbers. It's just more of a, uh, what is it? They're trying to, I mean, look, we all know that these streaming <laughs> services are not really making any money as much as they thought. I mean, no, did, they're not. No, you know, they, they're putting themselves even more so in debt, I think. Correct. Uh, you know, if, if you look at what uh, Netflix has done, they're actually in debt. Uh, some of, if, if what was the DC platform at one point? They actually had their own, but they wound up selling it off yeah, to HBO they had Max. Yeah, the, they had DC Universe or something like that, and then it went yeah. over to HBO Max. Yeah, so they but, had to sell know, out to get themselves out of debt there. Exactly. So, but we've Bros. seen, yeah, we've seen the industry on how they've been going, you know, so uh, it's or, interesting. Or, you know, unlike Disney, where, you know, they could buy their old IP back from Fox and just or buy out Fox and have their own IP right. back. Which many just, have actually, which many have actually uh, criticized that they probably paid way too much because seventy billion dollars is a lot of money. But that was they, a, a lot of everything else, not just the X Men. No, of course, it's a lot of like everything that. else, and it's just. Yeah. But it, you know, it has been criticized that it's a lot. But you know, we'll see. You know, actually, if it, they if, if are they, capitalizing in that. Honestly, if you look at the yet. app, not yet. Well, a little bit because if you look at the app. There's stuff that's overseas that we in America here don't get for Disney Plus. We don't get a lot of the R rated Fox movies that are adult rated or adult oriented in comparison. So Disney Plus there has a lot more to grab in that. Right, foreign. but having 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 the older stuff and not making money of saying, Hey, now we're gonna make some new stuff. So Yeah. So that's the that's the problem with their, you know, that Yeah. yeah I mean they, they it, in the long run, it will pay dividends, but right now it's not. So no. that's where that's why Disney's a little bit in trouble, and that's why you got you know, Bob that's why they, that, yeah, Bob Iger <laughs> coming back. You know, that, that's a whole drama that you know it could be an entire show, of course. So yeah, of you know, course. We'll, we'll leave that for some other time. But <laughs> all right, well, with that, we'll. Uh, well, I I and think it, we kind of put the nail in the coffin on. Right. Uh, Umbrella any Academy. Qu- any qu- any quotes on the uh, on this one? Because no, I, I didn't get there, really any quotes on this one. Though. Oh, you didn't. Uh, yeah. I like. I like. There was a few that I liked. Um, okay. Uh, I did like when Klaus and um, and Luther were in the bounce house, and <laughs> Luther and Luther's trying to convince him to go back. Yeah. And when he finally said, he's like he, and then when he finally agreed, he goes also. Just like a like a motivational scale of one to Braveheart, this was more like half of Rudy. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is just, like I said, the Klaus character is just insane, man. And and then he gave and there was another one that he goes, if I like he was talking to who was it? Oh, he was talking to uh, Reginald. Okay. And Reginald, and of course, Reginald giving him, I guess, whatever bullshit it was, he goes. And then uh, Klaus bounces back with, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I would have a dollar, which isn't much, but in a dollar store. (laughs) 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 It's just uh, there. There's some great. Sometimes they they have some great stuff that they come out with. You're like, that is just whoever wrote it. Epic, man. Epic. But yeah, like you said, you know, I think we put the nail on the coffin on this one. Yeah, I, I think it's a good way to uh, put the Umbrella Academy to rest. I'm pretty sure uh, Mr. Steve Brown will probably give his overall thoughts when we uh, start off Peacemaker about Umbrella Academy and, you know, uh, his feeling about the end of it. So we'll get his thoughts uh, uh, when we do that next episode. But uh, plus, we'll get more interesting quotes too from that particular <laughs> show <laughs> honestly there are a lot of interesting things about that show i would want to talk about <laughs> i definitely look forward to uh revisiting uh peacemaker because it's such a amazing show so yeah, yeah so when when that does come back we will be doing this that particular season two episodically so episode by episode because that's how hbx uh, hbo max actually rules at this point <laughs> so all right well with that we're just gonna move into uh well obviously no feedback i asked you guys i didn't get anything but you know we'll let you know about feedback at the very end 
But we're just going to move right into uh, news. So with comic news, uh, so let's talk about uh, Ant Man and Quantum uh, Ant Man and Wasp and Quantum Mania. We got the third trailer out now. I'm yeah. looking more and more forward to seeing this particular movie because uh, I'm just curious about this whole Kang the Conqueror. Uh, where I'm curious about, uh, you know, the other characters within it, Hank Pym himself, his wife, Janet Van Dyne. And right. what did Janet Van Dyne do in the quantum mania or uh, quantum verse at that point? Right. Uh, how does she know Kang? Because she had that look of fear because of, uh, Ant man's daughter herself you know creating some sort of uh device and then they all have to battle it out within the quantum verse and with a different king i don't think this is the same king uh that we saw at loki so i think you know the great thing about this one um trailer is that it kind of gives you a little bit more of an idea of what's going on or what could possibly go is going on because the first trailers were very uh flashy and and just kind of more uh more eye candy than anything else yes but on this one you could tell that you know this is going to be a movie where scott lang is going to have to make some decisions and actually might actually make some decisions that are more selfish than anything else because of his daughter yes uh but also kang you could see because the character of kang in the comic books is it's he, Franklin Richards, everybody. If you right, read the it's, comics, it's it's a an alternate version of of Franklin Richards. Yes. Oh no, of uh, Reed Richards. Well, no, no, Reed Richards' uh, deci- uh, descendant, which would be oh, descendant, correct? Yes, of oh, Franklin Richards, actually. It, but he, it, Reed Richards, obviously of the Fantastic Four, right? uh had this has part in developing or creating who kang is but but when you see him portrayed in comic books he's basically a blue character with these like lines down his face on this one it looks more like scars they are battle scars yep the uh the i forgot what they he was called in loki but he didn't have those scars there no he did this is a this, this is, is a variant even... version of that particular uh, he who he who I don't know he who I... something yes but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the thing is that you could tell that this is probably a different Kang uh, and there might be multiple Kangs it might be a ton of different Kangs you know out there again because of the whole multi there were at least three or four within or actually five within the actual Marvel comics. Right. One of which that took over uh, the mantle of like Iron Man wasn't Ironheart. It was somebody else. Uh, Iron Lad. That's who it was. And then <clears throat> he was a pharaoh. Right. In, in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, that battled the Fantastic Four at one point. We have the version of Kang itself. The, uh, right. Kang the Conqueror, who we all know. And then there was another one that they actually did kind of have that historical view of who Kang was right within the fantastic four and explain the variant versions. And, but this is in later Marvel comics, everybody. So <clears throat> my, my best suggestion would be listen to Rob on comics explained in YouTube. He has <laughs> the full gist. He has the full backstory of Kang the conqueror. And in comparison to Loki, as well as what we're going to see in Ant Man and the Wasp and Quantum uh, and Quantum Mania. Correct. So, so yeah, so this is different. I mean, uh, of course, than the comic books, but you know, uh, the one thing I, li- I liked was because in the Loki show, mm-hmm. people complain it's like that doesn't look like Kang. And on this one, they finally gave Kang that blue face. But you know, they made they made it seem like okay, there's a reason. It was for part the of blue a face. helmet, and it was part of the lighting, like a force and it, field and or enhanced, something like that. It enhanced his uh, scars, so, so it gave us that look, that classic look that we do see in the comics, where it's like a right. kind of a purplish kind of face with a bluish scar or a line down his face, and then like sides. the costume and everything. So I thought that was cool that they, you know, they still respected that, which is one thing that Marvel does very well. Mm-hmm. A lot um, of Easter eggs that we get. Correct. 
So it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, this uh, this came out. I look forward to seeing it. I already bought tickets, and <laughs> I yeah, I definitely already bought tickets. I and um, I think that uh, you know, Phase Five is. Uh, I'm looking forward to see where they're going with this because Phase Four just did not impress me, and it did not impress a lot of people. But we'll see where. Hopefully, they can capture that magic back again because Kang is a difficult character hmm. to kind of make you know into like the the perfect the, villain for the, the perfect, particular phase. i mean comic books he works but you know we'll see and then we have to see how secret wars and everything you know is going to it's going to be multiverse based based upon yeah. that original so, 2015 comic that came so I'm out ho- yeah so i'm yeah. hoping that you know that uh how you call it a uh, phase five fi- finally starts to put things a little bit more together yeah it's kind of there's kind of a rumor that there might be a Fantastic Four character in the movie. That is not an hmm. official thing. This is something I got from somebody that probably got some insight into it. But that's not uh, that's not an official thing. That, I mean, it could just hmm. be rumor. So don't take it as like, hey, this is official. But I hear that they might be a thing where they might actually show Reed Richards and, uh, and Susan Storm. Don't know if that's true or not. I look forward to see, you know, so it'll be uh, very interesting. All right, cool. Um, hmm. All right, well, uh, that's it for about news. I don't really want to get into too much. The only other one that I would really like to talk about, but actually floats into podcast recommendations. Uh, The Last of Us came out, uh, which is a uh, video game turned into an HBO Max show. Now, uh, our friends over at Podcastica, Jason has ended with Walking Dead cast and is now doing The Cast of Us, which is literally uh, Ben Beck, Rima Joe, Jason, Lucy, whenever she can because she hasn't played the game. But you got a, a few, you know, game players there that uh, are huge zombie fans, uh, huge game fans as well as the show itself that we've been looking forward to being adapted right they just got their first episode out and they just did their feedback which is amazing it was immense uh mine was in there but the uh i'm really liking on the idea of the show and i'm loving what they're doing with the podcast there's also a companion podcast too for the last of us from hbo so they right. put that at the very end uh rob what did you think of the actual episode did you watch uh, it yeah i did watch it and so uh, i i'm not gonna say i'm a huge gamer um me i think you, know, you know i play games don't get me wrong i do play my games you know my ps5 and a xbox x i played the last of us only for about maybe half an hour and then after that i not that i got bored of it or anything like that it was just i just moved on to something else and never went back to it okay (laughs) but i would say that they you know they kept with the way it's supposed to look Mm -hmm. very very much they did change a slightly little things in the beginning but just not much from what i've been hearing from uh people are journalists out there is that they have gotten their hands on all nine episodes and they've seen the whole thing. Yes. And they said that this is basically, so here's what I would say. And and I would say it just like they said, this show is not really meant for those who are the gamers. And I say that because every time there's a video game interpretation, every gamer gets upset. Right, they get upset. It's like, oh, it's not like the game. It looks different. They change things around. Just like we talked around. about it with Uncharted on Adrenaline Cinema podcast. It, it, a exactly. Lot, so a lot of people, it, it, yeah, it'll, you have to see it from both perspectives as a movie fan, correct, as well as a video gamer. In my opinion, what since I played the whole game all the way through and watched the first episode, I was trying to grab for my controller for every time I saw. <laughs> Sarah right. going through in the very beginning because that's how I got so used to it because certain scenes were scenes for scenes in the store Correct. plot within the game, but you weren't killing as much. Exactly. Uh, and at that point, you kind of were driven out and then you were based more within the story and you could understand. It's like, okay, I'm not playing a game now. I'm actually watching right. the show. 
this is like not a uh YouTube watch through. It's like three and a half, four and a half hours. Right. That the people do. It's a gameplay all the way through with the story plots. But uh, it, it is a little bit different. And I will say this. You have to uh, take it with a grain of salt. Because honestly, that's how Interview with a Vampire will be. From Anne Rice's novelization to that particular adaptation. Right. Uh, Rima and Paik were going to cover uh, Mayfair Witches. Or according to Paik, Mayfair Mitches. <laughs> he can he got it uh I've, or wayfair mitches right. i forget how he joked about it but uh gotta love pig for saying that but the thing was just like rima really couldn't do it and i understand it because if you don't have any love for it she watched the first episodes and she uh, first episode and she read all the books and said right away i can't podcast about this because i can't get into it now this one thing whether you can get into it on an extreme, I hate this, but a lot of people don't like to cover stuff and say they hate it all the time because it's not really fair to the listener. You have to have some sort of duality to yourself. You, some things that you do like about it or some things you just don't like about it, right. but you still overall love it to some degree. So I give her uh, her credit because she's right in saying, it's like if you're not passionate about it, don't do it. So they announced they were going to do it, and they said no, but I was going to continue with the uh, uh, Anne Rice interview with the vampire. But they uh, that if you look at that, that was very different from the source material. The, right. The video game is very different from, which is the source material to the show to some degree, but if you look at certain scenes, a lot of them are verbatim. You're not going to get um, the, well, the... Here, here's what they said because this is this is really interesting. So, okay. out of out of all video game adaptations, it is the one that is the closest to the source material than any other ones out there. Yeah. Uh, so by season four, season they say season uh, season four, they say episode four is going to do something slightly different than the game. But then after that, mm -hmm. uh, episodes five, uh, six, seven, eight, and nine are basically shots for shot of the actual video game okay. plus all the um all the dialogue is exactly the same basically they say you're basically looking at the at video the game. game so okay. the so you know they were saying so a lot of people are like well if it's if i feel like i've done this before like so to them it was like okay so this has been shown but they so that's why they're saying this is not for gamers this is for people who have never played the video game Correct. or never even heard about it because of the storytelling, the story being such, itself so so great, yeah. Which it is 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 phenomenal. So for me, I, like I said, I played half an hour of it, but I, the rest of the story, since I haven't played it, for me, it's intriguing because it's like, okay, this is actually great writing. Yeah. So I'll be, I'm looking forward to uh, the the, uh, the show and seeing how how that goes how and it progresses. Yeah I, yeah, I feel the same way. I I started a re quick replay and what I can remember and trying to catch up. I pretty much got up to where the second episode is. Right. Uh, I haven't gone back yet. I'm working everything and life happens. But I, um, I as actually, the, as I of actually this podcast, did the second episode come out? No, not yet. Not yet. But not yet. Okay. where yeah. I am in the game right now is where oh, the okay. second episode would be. Oh, but I see. <clears throat> the, the funny thing is, is though, throughout the first episode, there was exact dialogue. And somebody actually on TikTok, or Twitter or whatever had put side by side comparison. Correct. And it's why would to hear Pedro Pascal and um forgetting the girl's name, forgive me, but they did it exactly as it was from from like, the this, right from the yeah. game and stuff. And, they, and that's they what they said. Each side by side. Right. And that's what they cadence. said. Yeah, that's what they said. They said that it's basically the same. It's basically the game on film. That's yeah. what it is. There might be some slight changes, and the reason for the some of the slight changes is because while you're playing the game, so mm -hmm. perfect example of that is, so when you're playing the game in the beginning, you're you're the girl that's actually just walking around the house, mm -hmm. so you get to see little tidbits of you know okay what the family is, you get to see some of the uh, the 
you know, like her room and you kind of get to know who this person is. Well, you can't do that in, in, in a, you know, in a show. Mm-hmm. So they kind of put some things in there in sure. order to let you know how she, but then after that, it just became the game, you know? <laughs> so, so yeah, I look forward to it. I think it's actually, I mean, Pedro Pascal is phenomenal in it. Uh, it's, let me tell you, it's a, uh, it, I, fr- I believe I heard that it was the second highest viewing in HBO max history. Huh. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, you can't beat that. Yeah. So that it's it's great. So yeah, I look forward to that. All right, cool. Um, well, next up, well, like I said, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about like uh podcast recommendations. So uh just to let you guys know, watched it in the eighties. That's on the Pirate Core Entertainment network uh by damien and his friend they talk about rain man on this current episode which is pretty cool coming up uh if it's not been recorded already but they will be doing it run for your lives covering the menu with anya taylor joy i still haven't seen that it it was actually pretty cool you could find them on the podcast network as well uh as the cast of us with uh jason rima and ben and they're actually doing a cast of us and you got Daphne and Paik on podcast go doing run for your lives and covering the menu. So, uh, yeah, a lot of good and great podcasts out there that our friends do. Well, Rob, your particular podcast, do you want to enlighten everybody what's going on? Sure. With that? I mean, uh, my podcast called the uh, fantasy picks movie edition. Um, so what we do is we, um, we take over overhyped, tentpole movies that were uh you know that was supposed to be a a big hit and they turned out not to be so movies that either critically or financially just did poorly in the box office so we what we do is we do a fantasy pick on it so we go in we analyze the movie on what 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 went wrong what we could have done right and of course uh pick out we 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 play film let's say we play filmmakers and we get our own cast, we get our own director, and we do go from there. Also, we do a top five movie draft. Uh, so depending on genre, depending on actor and what it is, you know, so we, those those are usually a lot of fun. And we're adding a section on the basically the state of the Star Wars universe. And what we mean by that is uh, while a lot of people out there will cover some of the episodes and things like that, we're not only covering that, but we're actually covering what's going on behind the scenes with Lucasfilm and, you know, and the state of that. So, uh, so yeah, so we have a lot of great things planned. We actually did our season one. We just finished it, uh, at the end of December and we're going into season two, probably in an, in, I would say in another four weeks start as of, as of this podcast. I mean, today's what the, uh, <laughs> the ninth, uh, 19th. The, <laughs> the 19th so yeah so probably uh i would say maybe uh i'm thinking probably in the middle of february is when okay. we'll uh do uh but we'll you know we'll definitely announce it you know as as we get close we'll announce that but yeah it's uh it's going to be actually more exciting than uh it was before and uh, we'll go from there yeah and as always rob will probably be on here or adrenaline cinema depending on uh, what we're covering so uh keep in tune for that uh, to show more shout outs, uh, we're going to go right to YouTube and who we cover with that. Grim Life Collective interview with Shelly Long. That just came out not too long ago. That's pretty cool. Um, Michael and Jessica, as we all know from the Grim Life Collective, are co producing a uh, horror movie that are out there that Shelly Long actually is involved in. So they had a lengthy little uh, interview with her outside her car, which is weird, where she lives. But it was cool that they actually got it. And I thought uh, it was something pretty cool to bring up. Um, I'm going to have to say Sean Clark and Chris and the Thing with Two Heads podcast that you can find on YouTube as well. And they had Nick Castle and Mr. Warlock himself, the two people who played the shape, the one who played the shape in Halloween 1 and the shape who played in Halloween 2. The Michael Myers themselves, both on one podcast. So you could see that with uh, Sean Clark and Christopher Nelson on the Thing with Two Heads podcast on YouTube. 
and show a little bit more love uh, and to show our support because Rob and I are both big Kevin Smith fans. Uh, as you all know, I did the interview with Kevin, wow, way back when. And uh, at the time, Kevin had COVID, but he's uh, going strong and has been doing a lot of things. He's been doing a, li- a lot of live events. Clerks 3 has come out. He did the whole road show with that. Seen the movie 89 times in the theater. And with that, he bought himself his own theater. And that's Smod Castle Cinemas, which is formerly the Atlantic Highlands Movie Theater or movie show or complex that uh, Kevin used to go to as a kid with his father. So he bought that with him and his friends. So it's a still a mom and pop shop. Kevin's name might be on top of it. Smod Castle will be all over it. It's still a living movie theater. There are events that Kevin will be at and I have been at. Uh, one of which that I mentioned on the Facebook page. And yes, guys, we do have a Facebook page. And I'm sure you listeners who are regular know this. I had posted that I was there for uh, a night with Kevin Smith. And we watched Batman 1989. So uh, Kevin introduced the film, was there for a good, I don't know, half hour longer than he should because he had a family emergency and he had to get flown out really quick that night he had a last minute call but uh at the end of the night they had some um auctioning of stuff uh some comics at that point and mr michael zapsik himself from comic book man who runs the jay and silent bob secret stash on 65 broad street in red bank new jersey uh he uh gave some answer and question stuff at the very end of uh, Batman 1989, which I hung around for, which was pretty cool. So it was a good event to go to. It only cost you the cost of a ticket. Like I said, there was an auction at the end. And the reason for the auction is for this. Literally to get the small independent movie theater a get going. Um, You know, they rely on ticket sales like any other movie theater, but the more that you pay into it, the more it stays around, the more you get to see movies like this. Yes, Kevin's name is on the cinema. He is a part owner, but they still need money to come in. So if you feel the need and you want to just go, come on, Kevin's name's all over it. Hell, Kevin's been there almost every week for the past two months promoting this. and. I got to see him last week, and this is also a plug, yet again, a plug, not just for the Smart Castle Cinemas, but that Kevin Smith fan club.com. So you could easily go there to that Kevin Smith fan club.com or however you want to call it, TKSC. Uh, you could easily just join up. There are different variations, but with that, you get some privilege. So I went, the last one I went to last week, I went to see Iron Man and Kevin was there. He was there for the whole night. I think he was actually recording while the movie was playing in another room. He was probably recording with Mr. Mark Bernard on Fat Man Beyond because I heard something in between. I'm like, that sounds like Kevin. (laughs) Somebody playing that live and loud? What's going on? It was him. I think he was recording. It could be. I didn't get him to say anything. I really didn't get a chance to talk to Kevin that night. But the cool thing was is that at the very end, he did a Q&A. Instead of auctioning off comics at 20 bucks a pop, 60 bucks a pop, or whatever, uh, he'd been sell- you know, auctioning off stuff from stat- the secret stash and things of that nature. Uh, little cool doodles that he did. People want moose jaws, so he has this thing of moose jaws that he could doodle. Sold that for 150 bucks, 160 bucks. He did three of them. So those are the little cool things you could do. And then it actually pays into the uh, cinema. The coolest part is being part of that Kevin Smith fan club, because little did I know at the very end, waiting at the very end of Iron Man, I was going to get called because they said, all the Kevin Smith fan club members, please stay. I sat right back down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's going on here? Am I in trouble? And <clears throat> basically, they um, they wanted us up there for Wake and Bake. 
So you might see me on YouTube eventually for the wake and bake with my goofy ass, my hands in my pocket, don't know where to look, and everybody else saying how they felt about the movie. And he was looking for one word to describe the feeling about the event itself. I was that man. Now, mind you, I was on the far left of the man himself, and he looked at me like, and I think in the back of his head, he's going, what the hell are you doing here? All right, so I, I'm i on film, and it's, uh, it's cool that you could actually have that little bit of interaction with Kevin even after that. Uh, I got to talk to him for a little bit. Uh, the one question he had for me is, why are you here <laughs> to see a movie with you? And to have what I said at the very end of that particular thing, fun. And that's what it is. It's fun. So if you are a Kevin Smith fan, you love Marvel films, you love Batman. They're doing uh, the Fat Man Beyonds doing and continuing. They're going to do Batman Returns. Right. Uh, the Merry Marvel Movie Society is going to come back. Not They just did Iron Man. They're going to continue on in sequence and do The Incredible Hulk. So uh, check that out and have fun with that. Um, but yeah, that's a, a nice plug for them. So if you're somebody local to New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, it's within hours of you just to make an event for the day. Kevin has multiple and I'll only rattle off a few, uh, one of which is, well, Mallrats, <laughs> the Mall night of Mallrats with, uh, Jason Lee and Jeremy London for a Q&A after you watch the movie is already on play come tomorrow night, Saturday, the 20th. But uh, I'm sure they're going to have video up on that regarding that. Uh, you're going to have Josh Rausch's film series, Rauschemon. And that's literally all the documentaries that Josh Rausch does for Kevin Smith, which would be uh, uh, Walrus Yes, uh, Magnus Dopus, the Clerks 3 documentary, and uh, one of Josh Roush's original movies himself. Uh, after that, there'll be an all night with Clerks, and that's where you could sleep with Clerks. Unfortunately, Morat's one is sold out, and so is the Clerks one, but uh, the Clerks one is a pretty cool one, so I wish I had jumped onto it, because literally from 11 o'clock on, you sleep overnight in the movie theater. And Kevin is there, too, by the way. He basically t said, if you buy tickets, you must wear your pajamas. So he wants everybody in their pajamas. So that means, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who bought tickets get to be on film in your pajamas with Kevin Smith. I'm curious <laughs> as to what he'll be wearing. <laughs> but uh, I still haven't met Kevin Smith uh, personally, so I mean, I'm glad you've met him. But I, I mean, I'm a fan of his, but I just haven't met him yet. Hopefully, one day I will. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure your paths will cross. He's he's a lovely gentleman. Like I said, it's easy for you too, as a fan, to meet him if you go to Smod Castle Cinemas. Uh, there are live events at Jane Zion Bob's Secret Stash. He's having a signing on the twenty second at the stash. So if you really feel that you want to do it, go get your stuff tagged by Kevin Smith. Uh, the cool thing is, though, every time I went to one of these movie events and I'm saying it, if you go to the Incredible Hulk one, there will be a comic book or something signed in the bag for you because it comes with the ticket. So I got three Marvel comics and a little cool mini poster of Mr. Kevin Smith himself. Mm. signed <laughs> which was drawn by nate gonzalez which is yeah. in the stash too he has a whole book of posters that he does of for kevin bernardin uh ralph garman and everything that he's done when it comes to uh fat their man pod, beyond yeah, their podcast and everything all like their intro art uh is on this book yeah i've heard about it i hear that it's a uh, it's pretty cool yeah so uh yeah Keep that in mind. Just all you have to do is go to smodcastlecinemas.com, Jay and Sound Bob, secretstash.com, that Kevin Smith fanclub.com. Get all your information there. Obviously, catch in on the cool stuff that's there and then just show your support too to the Smodcastle Cinemas. All right. So, 
we're going to wrap this up and move right into feedback as I mentioned it. And this is going a little longer than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, we can be heard because you're hearing us already on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast player of choice you use. If ratings are available, please give us a rating or a review. One or any of the, all the platforms, Apple Podcasts, if it's there, please just give a review and thumbs up. That's one that's being heralded a lot. Uh, you could just go to our website. Still under construction. I'm working on that. Yes. I keep saying this, but I am. <laughs> panels to pixels podcast.com i'm working on mine too so don't feel bad <laughs> <laughs> i need to yell at ming chen maybe he could help me <laughs> i already yelled uh, at I, him. i'm just i'm just being i'm just being lazy that's all it is so <laughs> I, I gotta get i gotta get on mine uh you could uh as always we always post what we're going to be covering next yes peacemaker is next and yes i did post an image and where to send your feedback to there's an image you just put the comments below the the image saying hey we're covering this soon please leave your comments so just go to facebook.com slash panels to pixels we're on twitter at panels to pixels unfortunately nothing new there yet because mr brown covers that so Mr. Steve Brown will be back within the next episode and we'll get back on track. Same thing with our uh, our Instagram, which would be at panels to pixels podcast spelled out specifically. So uh, we'll get on track with uh, Twitter and Instagram. But you could also send your email feedback as regular texted email at panels to pixels one at gmail dot com. Just Write it out, a full email. We'll read it right on the podcast if we get it. If you feel that you need your voice to be heard, all you have to do is record yourself. Anybody can do it. Record it on your phone, set it as an attachment, and send it through that email, and we'll play it. And then we'll comment on it as we listen. Uh, we could be also be heard on YouTube. All you have to do is search Panels to Pixels podcast while you're there. And subscribe if that's your preference or preferable way to listen to the podcast or give it a thumbs up, which actually helps us out. Uh, I would like to get monetized. I uh, actually have the videos for Kevin Smith, uh, Ming Chen and Mike, as well as Marilyn Gigliotti, who I just did the interview not too long ago of from Clerks 3 and Clerks, who you know as Veronica. Yes, I'm working on more people, people <laughs> to come on. Mm. So it'd be cool. But uh, other than that, uh, next episode, Will, we'll be uh, covering Peacemaker Season 1 as a whole. Rob, Steve, and myself. As you know, Rob could be heard on uh, Fantasy Picks Movie Edition. So keep an eye and check that out. You could hear me on Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. So by the time you get this one, I believe Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 19... I'm forgetting the year. It's 70-something, but it has Donald Sutherland in it. And... Jerry and I had already covered it and recorded it, but it should be up by now. So you could check that out. So uh, with that, that's our show. Same podcast, different panel, different pixel. I'm Mark. I'm Robert. And this was Panels to Pixels podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next panel. Good night. Good night. <laughs>